Hi, everybody, and welcome to this new episode of Sage Makeup Fridays, Season 4. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. Once again, please meet my co presenter. Hi, everyone. My name is Segolen, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. My role is to help customers to get their ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Great. Thanks again for uh, helping us prepare this uh, new episode, Sego. So once again, this episode is uh, going to be demo based. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask all your questions. We have friendly moderators who are waiting to help. So uh, don't be shy. There are no silly questions. Uh, ask everything you'd like to know and uh, make sure you learn a lot. So uh, in previous weeks, we've covered some, uh, some different use cases on, uh, on model building, model tuning. And, uh, and this is actually the last uh, episode focusing on this uh, aspect of machine learning. Starting next week, uh, we will start uh, looking at uh, automation. Mm -hmm. and we'll probably revisit some of our uh, previous uh, use cases with uh, an automation angle. Okay, but for now, um, we are going to look at a new use case. Uh, so, Sego, what are we looking at this week? So, this week, Julian, we are going to work on a recommendation use case specialized, mm -hmm. specialized for retail uh, application. Starting from an online retail data set, we are going to train a model mm -hmm. that predicts the quantity of items that a customer is likely to buy. Okay, interesting. So another another recommendation uh, yeah. example, but this time for retail. Okay, so what here's the notebook we're uh, we're gonna work with. Uh, you can get it right now, or you can get it later. I'll show this again at the end of the episode. So don't worry if uh, if you didn't have time to to grab it. But everything we're doing today, you can actually uh, replicate. So let's take maybe a quick look at the uh, at the architecture. Okay, uh, see what we're gonna use today. So we're going to start from uh, we're going to start from a data set. Um, we're going to do some processing on mm -hmm. it, uh, some cleaning, and uh, and some I would say heavy duty preparation mm -hmm. for the algorithm that we're using um, today. We're using factorization machines, and data needs to be organized in a very precise mm -hmm. way. As we'll see, we'll spend some time discussing that, and then of course we'll uh, train the model and uh, we'll see how that works. Okay. And um, I guess we'll talk about you know deployment and um, and um, automation again, starting in uh, in in future episodes, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, starting next week. Okay, so recommendation. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, so it's here. It's retail. So we have um, users, we, customers. We have. Items, yeah, so items, okay, yeah. and certain customers um, maybe interaction buy, yeah, interact <laughs> or buy uh, certain items. Mm -hmm. And so, what's the what's the name of the game, really? How, how can we represent that problem? So we can represent this problem as a very large matrix mm -hmm. uh, showing the interaction between uh, user and items. Okay, so imagine we're trying to build. Uh, mm, a recommendation model for movies, hmm? right? So we have users, we have movies, potentially lots of users and lots of movies. Here we have a very short, uh, very small number, obviously, <laughs> to, to put that stuff on the slide. And okay, certain users are watching certain movies and they are giving them a rating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one, they really didn't like the movie. Five, they loved it. Okay, kind of like Amazon stars. So, for example, user one has, you know, uh, watched three movies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and that's you could you could kind of visualize the problem that way. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's the starting point. That's ground truth. That's what we know. Uh, but would user one like movie one? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Yet. We don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, and imagine we had. 10,000 movies, mm -hmm. obviously user one has not watched 10,000 movies. Maybe maybe they watched 15 or 20 or 100, but what about all the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get uh, a score, a rating for those empty mm -hmm. cells, right? That's the, the game, really. We're trying to fill 
all those cells. And then obviously find the ones with the highest score and recommend those. Mm -hmm. No one wants to be recommended a thousand movies, but out of uh, a thousand movies, which are the 10 high scores, mm -hmm. so to speak, right? The 10 movies that we think are the model things you're going to like. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the intuition or, uh, of what we're trying to do. Okay, so in this case, as you mentioned, we're, trying, we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, so we're trying actually to predict the, the quantity of items mm -hmm. that our uh, that a user is going to buy. Okay, um, it's it's a buy signal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're we think you know you would be interested in buying uh, those items. So it's a buy signal. Okay, it's a little twist on the on the recommendation problem, but it's still a recommendation problem. So okay, that's the first initial uh, let's say gut feeling. So uh, obviously we're not using movies here. Um, what what data set are we working with? So um, as you said, the, the game is gonna be to fill uh, empty sets, and right. we will show that with um, the, the, the data set we are going to use. Okay. So today the data set comes uh, from the UCI machine learning repository, the famous one, mm -hmm. and it's gonna contain uh, all the transactions occurring between um, 2010, uh, 2010 and uh, 2011 for a mm -hmm. UK-based uh, online uh, retail store. So okay. almost two years of historical data, or one year, uh, one year, sorry. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna have uh, 540,000 transactions, uh, if I remember well. And uh, okay, so reasonably large. Really, re re reasonably large. And uh, so we're going to uh, use this uh, data set in order to create okay. our recommendation system. OK, so here's the actual uh, data set. It's a, it's a CSV file. Uh, and we see invoice numbers and uh, um, stock code, uh, uh, so serial, serial codes um, you know, for, uh, for the, the products. We have a description. We have the quantity that the customer bought, and then the date unit price, customer ID, and UK. So here we see, for example, in this invoice, the same customer, oh, it's actually, yes, yeah, actually a bigger invoice. It's all, yeah, all these, right? So all these are a single invoice and they include different products from the same uh, UK-based customer ID. Mm -hmm. and in fact, a lot of those, you know, if you, you, you may be wondering why would anybody buy, I don't know, uh, so many items like 32 bird ornaments <laughs> because this data set actually uh, uh, contains information for a wholesale uh, wholesale customers okay and so that's why also predicting the, the predicting the quantity of items makes sense right i mean i guess individual customers would buy one piece of pretty much everything yeah uh, but obviously, for wholesale customers, you know the, the quantities would be uh, would be much higher. I don't really think anyone needs forty eight <laughs> inflatable <laughs> political <laughs> goals. But although, yeah, see, that's a French guy, so you never know. You never know. We're capable of anything. Uh, so, but that's more more likely uh, uh, <laughs> more likely a wholesale customer. Okay. So again, that's why the the quantity makes a little sense here. So. Pretty easy, simple data set, um, you know, quantities, text. Okay, so we'll need to do something about that. Uh, see if we can, uh, uh, if we can learn a little bit about, uh, maybe do a bit of NLP here. Let's, let's, let's see what we do, okay? Um, okay, so that's fine. Uh, so it's, like you said, it's 500,000. I don't know if we can, oh yeah, we're gonna go all the way. <laughs> 500,000 for, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, lots yeah. of stuff, but <laughs> it's quite small. in fact, it's <laughs> quite small, right? Uh, when we talk about recommendation, mm -hmm. um, what about, you know, what about Amazon? What about Netflix? What about Spotify? What about even large, large e-commerce? Millions of, millions of users and millions, okay, millions of users, millions of millions, items. Millions of items, maybe even more. Okay, even. but let's say okay, millions times millions. Okay, let me go back to this uh, my toy example here. Okay, so imagine millions of rows, millions of columns. Uh -huh. That's thousands of billions mm -hmm. of cells, mm -hmm. and of course, most of them are empty. 
sparse right? matrix. So it's a very sparse matrix. And, you know, I, I thought about this and, okay, I've been buying stuff on Amazon for about 20 years. Okay. 20. I think my, my first orders were in 2001. So let's say I've bought one product per week for 20 years. Okay, so let's say 50 weeks per year, uh, 20 years, it's a thousand, thousand weeks. So my gut feeling is I bought, let's say, a thousand products mm -hmm. from Amazon, something, something in, that, in that range. Okay, so assuming that there are 10 million products on Amazon, on Amazon right now, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking it's probably more, mm -hmm. um, but let's stick with the 10 million. Mm -hmm. Then if, you, if I actually... Uh, if I actually built a row for me, right, with the 10 million products and, and flagging uh, the, the thousand that I bought, then that row would be 99.99% per percent empty. empty. Mm -mm. So that's why I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a number we, we give all the time, 99, 99% sparsity, but it, I, I think it actually makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? I think the, 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 you know, the ballpark estimate is, uh, is pretty good here. So that's pretty bad, right? Because if we want to store that data set in a matrix like that, 99.99% uh, .99 of cells are empty, so there are going to be zero values. Mm -hmm. But that still takes 32 bits, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and when we start working with the matrix, multiplying things, etc., we end up multi mostly multiplying zero by, by zero. zero. <laughs> So very cool, loading lots of zeros on the CPU or the GPU and multiplying that and getting a predictable answer of That's very zero. Difficult. So it's, it's horribly, <laughs> horribly inefficient. So that's the first problem we, uh, that's the first problem we have to solve. So let's keep that in mind for now. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the algo that we're going to use. Ah, uh, cool. Okay, so mm -hmm. what are we using? Ah. <laughs> now we are going to use um, so the intuition, so based on what we said and the, mm -hmm. the, this issue of uh, sparse data and sparse matrix, is to replace very large, very sparse matrix uh -huh. by a product of ah. two much smaller dense matrices. Uh -huh. Now we're making progress. Uh -huh. okay. right. Beautiful. And we're going to explain this one because it gave me a headache so, a few years ago. <laughs> In order to. <laughs> Why, why do we want to do that? Because we want to uh, approximate uh, existing instance as closely as possible and predict new instance. We are going, in order to do so, we are going to use the factorization ma ma uh, machine algorithm, mm -hmm. which, is, is can, which can be seen as a kind of uh, generalized, uh, as a generalized li linear regression uh, okay. algorithm. So it's, it's a really, really cool algo. Uh, I, I put a link to the, to the research paper. It was right. actually invented in 2012, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we have the research paper. I'll show. I'll show you the paper in a minute. Um, and and it's it's really powerful, and uh, it's still uh, heavily used today, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it is a built-in in SageMaker. And it's built-in in SageMaker, so we don't have to write the code, which is great. So again, imagine on the left here, you have your matrix with users and items and you know, either a rating or, you know, whatever value you're trying to predict. Okay, so for us, again, it's going to be quantities, but it's the same. Um, so imagine this thing is, you know, one million lines, one million rows, maybe more. Hugely inefficient. And what factorization machine does is it will actually uh, compute mm -hmm. two smaller, much smaller mm -hmm. matrices. Okay, and you can see they have a common uh, dimension, okay, which is this thing here, it's called the number of factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number of factors here is gonna be two, okay? This dimension here and this dimension here. We'll talk about this again. And this is a uh, dense matrix. Mm -hmm. And the magic, really, and I, it's a little bit magic to me, because I don't understand the math, but when you multiply those two matrices, you closely, uh, not only do you closely approximate the, the existing values, the ground truth values that you have, but of course, you also have you also compute values for all the the, the empty cells. Okay, <clears throat> so that's you know that's pretty cool because you this means you you can manage your model is really built from those two much more matrices. So you have a really small model um, that predicts the right 
predicts closely to ground truth and predicts all the other cells, right? So that's what we're trying to do here, okay? Really, really cool. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting algo. Um, so that's what we're using, factorization matrix, a uh, factorization machine, sorry. And uh, as you mentioned, it's built in in SageMaker. Okay, so let me uh, jump to this. Okay, here's the research paper. Okay. Oh, it's actually, yeah, it's actually 2010. 2010. Okay. 2010. Yeah, well, it's the end of 2010. <laughs> I did the two. Yeah, so it was, it was close. Okay, I was almost right. Okay, for a Friday, it's not too bad. Okay, so you can go on and read that uh, cool paper. Okay. And uh, if you look at the SageMaker documentation, then you see, of course, uh, it's supported and you get plenty of interesting information. We'll look at some of the hyperparameters, etc. Okay. So it's generally, uh, um, I, I think it's generally an easy algorithm to work with because mm -hmm. it doesn't have so many ultra weird parameters, but, but, yeah. but, but uh, yes. <laughs> preparing data for it is, yeah. I'm not going to say a little tricky, but it's a little different from mm -hmm. what we usually do. So I think it's, it's good that we look at this one now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let's go and take a look at the notebook. So first of all, we're doing basic cleaning, basic prep, uh -huh. and then we're doing the actual <laughs> formatting for the algo. So for, for data prep, uh, the, the repository actually includes um, a data, a SageMaker data wrangler workflow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we've covered the uh, data wrangler very extensively in the first two episodes mm -hmm. of, the, of the season. So I'm going to skip it. But hey, if you want to go and, uh, and run data wrangler uh, and process the data with it and add more transforms, um, you know, it's, uh, it's in the repo, the flow file is here. Uh, and you can you can go and do this. So for a change here, we're gonna actually run the we're gonna actually run the the data prep with Python code in the notebook. Okay, and I think it's very interesting because you you can very easily replicate. You know, mm -hmm. typically I guess you, you I don't know some people would start with manual uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, work in the UI. Some people would work with uh, Python code. You know, whatever uh, floats your boat. Um, but it's uh, it's actually easy to to do one and the other. Mm -hmm. So if you write Python code and then you want to automate with a, uh, go back to a workflow that you can you know uh, automate etc. It's very easy to apply the same transforms in Data Wrangler. And of course, if you did the work manually in Data Wrangler, you can easily export to Python. Code. So fine, you know. <laughs> but just for a change, yeah, just for a change, let's go and uh, and do this in the notebook, okay, and do some pandas. Oh yes. Okay, so load the data set. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the same thing, of course. So first of all, let's try and find if we have missing values. And as a matter of fact, so we have some empty descriptions, which I guess we can live with. Mm -hmm. But we have lots of missing customer IDs. Mm -hmm. So that's that's obviously very bad, because how could you recommend something, something <laughs> to <laughs> someone you don't, you don't know? know right? it's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, you need two things. I'm sure some people are there with yeah, I have a great idea for this. It's like, fine, <laughs> let us know. But um, here we're gonna be very conservative and just drop, um, just drop the uh, the the rows that have no customer ID. Uh, yeah, we're stripping the description, so removing the left and right, any left and right space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in the process, we did lose a bit of data, which mm -hmm. is a shame. But then again, customer ID is kind of the the key thing. Uh, we can compute some stats uh, on the on those numerical fields. So the, we're gonna look at the quantity, the unit price. And everything looks okay, I guess. Um, so we see some you some unit some some products have a zero unit price. So I guess I, I, I don't want to zoom in on this because they could be freebies like okay yeah. you can you can get this stuff for free or maybe it's just bad data. Okay, so I'm gonna assume some stuff is free, but in 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 in, in real life, I, I would zoom in on this. Now, uh, negative quantities, um, no. Such okay. a big one. <laughs> Something is wrong. Okay, <laughs> something is pretty wrong here. Uh, so we can actually find all the rows with negative quantities, and there's about nine thousand of them. So again, I will take a deeper look, see what 
what's, it, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. thing here, but okay, for now we just drop. Okay. And just to make sure, okay, now we drop them and and yeah, quantities, the minimum quantity is one, right? Because you gotta you can order free stuff, but you gotta order at least one thing. Okay, you cannot have empty. Okay, so I think I think we're good. Um, so as we saw in the data set, uh, so we have uh, we have invoices with multiple uh, items, and of course the same customer is going to have multiple invoices, uh, and they could be uh, or repeat orders for the same products. Mm. So in order to have the actual quantity, uh, we want to uh, basically group, right? Mm -hmm. we want to reduce. Uh, all the rows that have the same product and the same customer. Okay. okay. So maybe, yes. So it looks like, you know, some people may want to order inflatable political globes again and again and again. And uh, that uh, Swiss customer did order 12. So it could be one single order, it could be multiple orders. But again, as we're trying to predict the quantity of um, for each individual item, we want to uh, reduce uh, reduce that stuff, okay? And we use pandas, and yeah, we could, you know, I guess, you know, you could use uh, Athena on that CSV file, and if you want, if you'd rather write SQL, why not? If you want SQL, like, group but, by. Yeah, <laughs> group by works, right? Works okay, very so, well on Friday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And again, pandas is very nice. So, so now we end up having about 200,007, blah, blah, blah. Um, rows with uh, unique products and unique customer items and a quantity. Okay, so that's the that's the data set we're we're working with. And if we if we come back to my uh, to my uh, sample metrics here, okay, this is what we built: okay? mm, 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 mm. customer IDs, item IDs, and quantities in the middle. Thank you, so to speak. Okay, fine. Uh, so now we need to do a little more, actually, because we have categorical values, uh -huh. countries. Um, uh, we have, um, so customer IDs are actually categorical descriptions, uh -huh. categorical values, right? Uh, items are categorical values. Uh -huh. Each is a different dimension, right? Again, um, you really need to understand that each item and each user a customer is a different dimension mm -hmm. either a row or a column so they need to be encoded as such are not numerical values they're really you know, lines and rows okay so we do that and yes we have the description so we could go extremely fancy here but <laughs> um i have to say the descriptions are pretty short mm -hmm. right um if we look at the data set there there are not you know they're not like extensive descriptions five that you would get yeah. yeah there are five of six words so i'm not sure how fancy you can get here and uh, in in this notebook we go with the reasonable approach where we use uh yeah tf idea so uh vectorization so term frequency etc um basically to count uh you know uh, how many times a word appears etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and that's going to give us uh, quite a few additional columns because the vocabulary in the in that in those descriptions it's probably a few hundred words maybe more so that's going to create lots of different a, a vector with lots of different uh, values so again very I guess basic option uh, but but we do that okay uh, all right so now we get to the slightly I guess complicated bit where we need to build the real matrix that the algo will work on. Okay, and I'm sorry to say it's not as simple as this. Okay, needs to look like this. Yeah, let me go full screen because I need to explain. So in fact, all um, uh, all dimensions in in the problem need to be columns mm -hmm. okay so we have as many columns as we have customers and we have as many columns as we have items, items. Mm -hmm. okay so i'm still using that movie example here but it could be products okay um and as you guess each row flags or you know one of encodes 
the actual user and the actual movie or the actual item. Okay, so each each row is actually in in our case in the data set we work with each row is going to be customer one two three bot item four five six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we would have a one for the customer cell, the a one for the product cell, and then the label. Okay, would be the quantity. The quantity for they bought. Okay, so as you can imagine, this is going to get really big. Okay, because uh, we want to encode it customers. So if we have a thousand customers, then we have a thousand columns. Mm -mm. Uh, if uh, we have ten thousand products, then we have ten thousand columns. <laughs> and we we also injected the uh, the, the vector with the description, the so that could be yeah. more columns. And uh, and yeah, so it's going to be a very big, very very sparse matrix. Even worse, right? It's actually even more sparse than this, right? Because we added so many columns. You can say, wait, 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 wait. You're just making things worse. What's the point? <laughs> well, the point is, this is what the factorization mach machines algo needs. Uh, uh, uh. So, the uh, specific input. input yeah, they need that specific. Uh, the algo needs that specific input format. Okay, so again. And that's really something that threw me off when I started working with that, with that algo. You know, because I had this row versus column thing and, and that didn't work. And then okay, I realized, no, 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 it's really all columns, mm -hmm. right? Rows are the different instances and columns are really all the features, all the dimensions. Yeah, it makes sense when once you know it. But yeah, that's... All right, so this is what we need to build and we need to save it in an efficient format. Not CSV? No, it's not going to be CSV. <laughs> it's not even going to be NumPy. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to the notebook. It's going to be a compressed sparse yes. matrix. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, it's compressed sparse row matrix, CSR matrix. So we can actually see how sparse this thing is. Okay. Um, because when we, so that H stack uh, call here is horizontal stack. So it just, takes the uh, the one hot encoded columns and the TFIDF column for description mm -hmm. and uh, and it just adds everything okay um, and the quantity is the, is the labels okay so we have all our columns next to each other and then we have the labels right and so we do this and then if we compute at the sparsity okay so uh, NNZ gives you the, the number of non-zero cells and we can see it's actually 99.9% sparse. Mm. Okay, so we have a huge matrix, uh, and it's only marginally <laughs> useful with uh, non-zero values. So it's uh, in this case again, it's not such a huge um, model, uh, such a huge matrix. Excuse me. That again, imagine millions of items, millions of uh, millions of rows you know, uh, millions of items, millions of users, that's millions and millions and millions of columns. And when you start one health encoding and the processing, it could be tens yeah, of millions, yeah. hundreds of millions of columns. It's, it's, it's literally huge, okay? Plus, then if you have, obviously, uh, you know, millions of actual ratings, you know, you can't work with that, okay? So, um, we're going to split it for uh, training and validation. And we're saving that for, you know, I guess, archive purposes to, to NumPy, okay? But then, okay, then the real, the, 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 the actual uh, uh, data formatting step is this, okay? So what we're doing here is we are taking that hugely empty and inefficient NumPy array, mm -hmm. okay? And we're saving it to uh, this uh, compressed sparse row matrix, okay? Uh, and saving it to protobuf format. Okay. And so protobuf is a um, uh, serialization format, mm -hmm. okay? Binary serialization, which is ex pretty efficient and dense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So not only do we have this uh, this CSR object, uh, which uh, which is yeah, here, yeah. yeah, we have this CSR object that is optimized to not to store zeros, right, pretty mm -hmm. much. We're taking this and we're saving it to a, a, a dense uh, a dense serialization format. So eventually this is actually pretty small. Right? Mm -hmm. It's 
pretty small and pretty efficient. So you could have a huge, 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 huge initial data set and, and compress it to very efficient and very dense um, uh, data set of data files. Right? So we have this for the, we have a protobuf file for the training set, protobuf file for the test set. And all the magic really happens in this uh, utility function, which is part of the SageMaker SDK. Okay, so uh, write sparse matrix to uh, a sparse tensor. So it takes uh, your feature matrix, uh, your oh, labels, yeah, label ve uh, vector labels, a label vector, sorry, and it writes that stuff to memory buffer. Okay, and then that memory buffer gets synced. It's three objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you write in memory, and then you push that to it. Okay. Good. SDK function. Super nice. <laughs> I, uh, I cannot imagine writing this. Okay. <laughs> not, in, uh, not in a thousand years. So, uh, no. So, yeah, this is completely generic. Uh, I've used this function, this exact same function, in many notebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you can, uh, so long as you, you pass the, the right types in X and Y, that works. Okay, uh, fine. Um, yeah, just works. Okay, and so we do this for the train set, the test set, and we have our friendly protobuf files in, uh, in S3. Okay, so here we're doing it in a notebook, but I guess. At scale, uh, in mm -hmm. production, you would automate this. You mm -hmm. would run it in uh, maybe SageMaker processing or, or you know, you could do this on all sorts of mm -hmm. AWS services, right? Especially but yeah, these are the steps, okay? Okay, so going from just to make sure, because again, I'm sure some people here are a little confused. So that's the, in, the that's the, I would say, naive, <laughs> uh, intuitive view, mm -hmm. okay? Um, this is what factorization factorization machine is going to do. Split that thing, and this is the technical format for the factorization machine. So same thing, but different formats, different views. But yeah, we're really yeah. just structuring the problem in a way that the algo can learn. Okay, all right. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so now we can train. Perfect. Okay, so let's try that. Okay, uh, and so let's jump to the good bit, which is this. Okay, uh, okay. So once again, built-in algo. Okay, we've seen this in the doc. Uh, how it works is nice until you see the formula. <laughs> oh, it's a simple one. Is it? <laughs> uh, now you're being. Not being rude to me. <laughs> okay, it, she says it's simple. Yeah. No comment. Uh, hyperparameters. Uh, so let's look at the required ones. Feature dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, so feature dimension is the dimension of the input feature space. So in plain speak, that means yeah. the number of columns. So in our, in our case, um, this I think we have the we have the actual number. Is it yes? Uh, so we have nine over nine thousand three hundred mm. cards. Okay, because number of users, number of items, and the uh, vectorization of mm. the description. Okay, so see that's quite large already. So that's the uh, feature dimension. Number of fact, and this is obviously required. Number of factors is this number of factors remember it's the common dimension okay. of those two matrices okay mm -hmm. so i'm going to trust the doc the doc says 64 typically generates good outcomes and is a good starting point so i love good outcomes and i love, <laughs> I love, good, starting, good, starting I love good starting point <laughs> thank you anonymous <laughs> doc writer uh, can you can you imagine the dog saying 64 is just a horrible guy you can use it? Don't use it never ever. Okay, nice, <laughs> nice. Like that. Okay, thank you, dog rider. So we're gonna go and try 64. And then we can discuss other options. Uh, predictor type. So factorization machines can actually be used for regression, which is what we're doing here, trying mm -hmm. to predict that numerical value. And it can also be used for binary classification. Okay, so we could predict in the, in the 0, 1 range and you know, say, okay, lower than 0.5 is no or 0, 
Okay. And uh, higher than 0.5 is uh, one, one, yes, true, whatever. <laughs> uh, and so here we are definitely using regression. All the other ones are optional and they're scary. Okay, so uh, unless you read the research paper and uh, and figure out if you know bias weight decay should be increased, <laughs> decreased, I'm very happy to live with default budget. Uh, number of epochs. Um, okay, and funny enough, this is optional, but generally, yeah, you don't need a, a, a large number of epochs to to get okay results, and then you know more more crazy. Um, more crazy practice and in this case we're gonna we're gonna ignore them okay all right so what are we doing here um, once again we retrieve the built-in algo uh, mm -hmm. container okay yeah. uh, if you're new to SageMaker sorry if you heard this one before for all the other folks but if you're new uh, well you're you'll be happy to know that uh, training and deployment on SageMaker is always container based mm -hmm. And, uh, and in this case, as we're using a built-in algo, we just retrieve the uh, the name of the container for uh, factorization machines. Okay, so you don't need to worry about Docker containers. You don't need to write about. You don't need to worry about writing that algo. It's already there. Just go and grab it. Uh, then the estimator. So that's the central object. It's where we configure the the training job. So which algo to use, meaning really which container. Uh, role so that's permissions allowing SageMaker to grab the container and uh, read write from S3 that kind yeah. of thing and again the role is is attached to the to your SageMaker Studio instance so usually that works uh, and infrastructure requirements okay uh, and I think I forgot to mention that in, in other episodes. But you can actually, if you're not sure, <laughs> um, all the built-in algos have uh, instance recommendations. Mm. Okay, so we recommend training and inference with CPU instances. Okay, uh, training with one or more GPU on dense data might provide some benefit. Um, okay, but we have very sparse data, so we don't want the GPU to multi to load. Mm. and multiply zeros just to tell us it's uh, the result zero. is a zero. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you, Doc Rider. We'll stick with, uh, with CPU <laughs> instances. Okay? And C5XL is, is a reasonable choice. <laughs> and where to save the model. Okay, now, hyperparameters. So, number of dimensions. Okay, so we actually have that value. It's so, the 9,300 mm -hmm. something number of columns. Okay. Minus the, the label, of course, we don't want to count the label. Uh, the predictor type, so we, uh, it's a regressor, uh, uh, a regression problem. The batch size, uh, 1000. You know, why not? Why not? Okay. You could, uh, you could argue if this is the best one. And number of factors? This is the best. 64, because <laughs> good outcomes. <laughs> good starting point. And good starting point. <laughs> and we're just starting. So <laughs> nice. And we'll train with 20 epochs. Um, you know, why not? Again, we could monitor the metrics. It's, um, uh, does this one support early stopping, by the way? Yeah, maybe we could check that. Not sure. Do we have early stopping here? Early. No. Uh, or patience. No, no patience parameter? No. Uh, no. Okay, all right. So we would have to be careful there. Okay, we'd have to be careful that we're not overfitting. Mm -mm. Okay, fine. But we can we can look at the log. Okay, and then we train. Okay, so just call train, pass the location of the training data and the test data, and we call fit. And off it goes. <laughs> and so we create that instance. That's C5. Yeah, C5 instance. We pull uh, the factorization machines container to it. We load the data. And um, and in this case, we are copying the data, okay? Um, because we're using file mode. And, uh, in the previous episode, we used pipe mode, remember? Um, and if you haven't watched it, go and watch that one. Uh, so pipe mode can stream um, 
data. So you save the copying and you don't have to worry about super huge data set that take forever to copy, require lots of storage on the training instances. So if I think for a recommendation, actually, if you had a huge data set, like gigabytes, tens of gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes, you know, pipe mode would be good mm -hmm. option. Okay, but here it's, it's not so big. Okay, and then it trains, and we have the training log with, oh, so let's see <laughs> the first. Okay, so then we see the epochs, right? So RMSC for, for the first epoch is, yeah, it's not so great, right? Uh, yeah, we see RMSC loss equal to, yeah, 251. Okay, and then it trains and you know we can hopefully get to a lower value. Okay, yeah, we get 62, that's much better. Okay, so we're learning stuff, mm -mm -mm -mm. okay? And I have to say, it's always a little bit more, uh, it's always a little bit difficult to uh, to understand that, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that value. So if you have a good intuitive way to explain it, I'm, I'm interested. I think for linear regression, it's, it's, very, it's easier because yeah. you can compare you can compare the scale of the loss to the scale of mm. the uh, of the values you're trying to predict. But I think here it's 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 a little more complicated. But at least okay, we're learning and we see yeah. um, we see that you know good stuff is happening. And you could argue you know should we continue training or or did we overfit? And here yeah, okay, of course it's just a quick demo. But of course you would want to uh, to plot and, and monitor yeah, those values yeah. and and uh, and figure that out. Okay. Uh, so we train for only two minutes, and then of course the first the uh, instance shuts down, and we only pay for that. And we've not discussed cost optimization so far. I guess it's a good topic for the automation, mm -hmm. yeah, for the automation um, um, episodes. You know, spot instead. Well, I think yeah. that's, I think she yes. just spot because everyone knows I'm lazy <laughs> and cheap. Okay. <laughs> And Spot could give us a very good discount. So yeah, don't worry. We'll we'll save you money in the other episodes. Just an incentive to keep you watching us. Okay. Uh, and so we've trained, and you know, uh, yeah, we could see the we can see the training job in in studio as well. Okay. If we go back yeah, to this. Uh, well, oops. Oh, sorry. I need to click on this. Yes. Okay, these are okay. Factorization machine. Yeah, that's that's probably it. Okay, and so here, of course, it's a very short uh, training job. It's only two minutes, mm -mm. so we don't have a lot of data points. But if if you have longer points, uh, you know, you can plot. You can actually plot your metrics right there. Uh, so you can plot. You can create line, um, time based, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Okay, here we kind of get the final value because I think you get one data point per minute. So we only get, you know, kind of the the final uh, the final value here. But if you have trained jobs that last for, let's say, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, or an hour or something, of course you can easily see the that nice curve. We see all the parameters, feature, you know. So it's all in there. Okay? And we see it in studio and of course you can query you can query that. Okay. You can call the can describe the jobs. I mean, we, we've seen some of those APIs over time, right? And yeah, we didn't do any debugging stuff. We showed debugger early on. Mm -hmm. uh, we showed explainability um, in the fraud detection, I think, example. Two weeks ago. Uh, bias, we also showed two weeks ago. Two weeks so, ago. So yeah, if you're curious about those, go and, go and watch uh, those previous episodes, okay? So... Okay, we train, we have a model, and so the next step, of course, would be to go and deploy it and predict with it. And uh, we'll talk about that in the uh, ops slash automation uh, episodes uh, in, in September. Okay, so uh, stick with us. I think this is pretty much what we wanted to show you today. So just a quick recap. Um, a quick recap. So we started from this reasonable uh csv data set okay. okay so we could pre-process it with uh sage mixture data wrangler which makes uh Sego very happy as you can see uh or of course we we can process it in the notebook okay and generally you're going to do one then the other you know i i'm uh you know 
I kind of like writing Python code, so fine. And uh, okay, most importantly, uh, so yeah, we did some pre-processing here, but we, we, we studied in detail how we need to format that data for factorization mm -hmm. sheets, okay, which, which is a little confusing the first time you saw it, you see this, but hopefully, you know, now you understand that, you know, this is the intuition view, this is the algo result, so to speak, but the data that needs to look like okay. okay. So yeah, I'll give you a second to take a screenshot of this because yeah, I wish this is actually, I actually did this. Uh, and I wish I'd found something like this on, on the web a few years ago. Okay, don't thank me. <laughs> uh, all right, and then we trained, which is really the simplest thing. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, business as usual. Fit. Yes, just create the estimator and fit. Okay, and this is really not difficult. Okay, all right, I think that's the end of this episode. Let me show you the, uh, the notebook URL again. Okay, here it is. So go and go and grab that, uh, and you can actually find lots of other examples. I didn't mention this before, but you know, go and explore this uh, sprawling repository. <laughs> um, the examples we've used so far are located in end to end. The music rec, which was the first one we've done. The fraud detection was number two, and then use cases with computer vision and retail reco and there are more and then you have more i would say technical examples if you want to zoom in on particular capabilities if you're interested in um, in um, pytorch tensorflow and all mm -hmm. that good mm -hmm. stuff it's the python sdk it's it's a big repo. So mm -mm. there's there's a good chance you're gonna find something. That <laughs> yeah. Looks like it looks like the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, so go go and explore that, and it gets updated all the time. Okay, so I hope this was useful uh, and a little bit fun because uh, that's important as well. And uh, so next week automation. Okay, so we're done with those four first episodes on I would say ML and data science and model building. And so next week, we're starting to look at pipelines, right? So we'll revisit some of these examples. We'll look at um, um, uh, registering those models in the model registry, managing model versions, uh, approving or rejecting models. Before putting into uh, Yeah, uh, uh, tracking model lineage, looking at all the artifacts that go into building a model. Uh, of course, automation with pipelines and really cool workflows and blinking stuff in studio. It's going to be amazing, right? It's going to be amazing. And we have four episodes of that, okay? So four amazing <laughs> automation episodes in September, okay? So stay with us. Thanks, Sego. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your help. And thanks for watching, everybody. And we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.